Good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us online for our third uh, Shelley 200 Roundtable event, uh, celebrating the life, work and thought of Percy Bysshe Shelley, which we hope will prepare the ground and set the tone for next year's Shelley Conference in July 2022. My name is Paul Stevens, and I will be chairing tonight's event, where our four brilliant panellists will pursue, define, explore um, a selection of Shelley's various fragments and discuss how Shelley's work exemplifies, relates to, perhaps illuminates our notions of one of the essential genres of romanticism, the romantic fragment. Before I introduce the panellists, um, I'd just like to quickly thank the co-organisers of tonight's event, uh, the Shelley Conference team, uh, Bish Inigo Coffey, Amanda Blake Davis and Anna Mercer, uh, the postgraduate team, Laura Blunsden and Anna Stevenson, and our conference advisory board, Will Bowers, Madeline Callahan, Kelvin Everest and Sharon Rustin. Before I begin, uh, I'd just like to politely remind everybody to ensure that microphones are muted and also that tonight's event is being recorded uh, and will be made available online for, well, I mean, as long as the internet lasts, really. So a good five or six years at least. Um, the structure of tonight's event will be familiar to those who have attended similar events in person or online. Um, I will first introduce the panel uh, and then I'll pose a series of questions which will serve as broad points of departure for the panelists to share with us tonight their expertise and their wisdom. At around eight o'clock, we'll talk for about 50 minutes, and around eight o'clock, um, British summer time, uh, I'll then open the floor to audience questions. So to pose your questions at that time, please just raise your hand via the hand function, or feel free to use the chat box to pose questions or to sort of discuss the ideas um, throughout the um, event. So without further ado, um, I am absolutely delighted um, to welcome tonight our four wonderful panellists. Um, I'd first like to welcome Dr. Carlene Adamson. Carlene is the co-editor of the fifth and final volume of the Longman Annotated Poems of Shelley, which is forthcoming uh, next year. Her editorial contributions to the volume include her work on the fragments associated with Hellas and Charles I. She will also be well known to many people in the audience as uh, for her, well, for her path-breaking editorial work on the Bodley and Shelley manuscripts, um, having edited two volumes for the series, Shelley's Peas and Winter Notebook, Notebook 17, and also the poet's Witch of Atlas Notebook, Notebook 14, which is perhaps my favourite one. Our second panellist tonight is Professor Nora Crook. Nora is Emeritus Professor of English Literature at, the, at Anglia Ruskin University. She is co-general editor of the multi-volume Complete Poetry of Percy Bysshe Shelley with Johns Hopkins. Um, she is, all, again, she is also quite well known to everybody here tonight as the general editor of the 12 volumes of Mary Shelley's works with uh, Pickering and Chateau, uh, which include her editions of Frankenstein. Uh, she has also edited two volumes of the Bodley and Shelley manuscripts, um, Shelley's Charles I draft notebook, no, notebook 19, uh, and with Timothy Webb, the poet's Faust draft notebook, number 18. Uh, she also found time to co-author one of, I think, the best monographs on Shelley's work to date, Shelley's Venomed Melody with CUP. Our third panellist tonight is Dr. Matalinda Nabagodi. Matalinda is the Leverhulme Trust and Isaac Newton Trust Early Career Fellow at Newham College in Cambridge. She was a postdoctoral research associate at Newcastle, where she worked as an editor on that fifth and final volume of the Longman Annotated Poems of Shelley. Uh, her current research focuses on Shelley and his circle with a particular interest in the poet's translations and foreign language learning, and with the miscellaneous material objects in the various Shelley archives. She is also currently producing a creative critical edition of Shelley's notebooks, informed by her interest in the work of uh, Walter Benjamin. And finally, our fourth panellist tonight is Professor Alan Weinberg. Alan is Emeritus Professor at the University of South Africa and an independent expert consultant for UNISA Research. 
He is the author of the magnificent monograph, Shelley's Italian Experience, and the editor of volume 22 of the Bodleian Shelley Manuscripts, the so-called box two of manuscripts. More recently, he has collaborated with Timothy Webb on two essential collections of essays, The Unfamiliar Shelley and The Neglected Shelley, both with Ashgate, uh, which provide, as many of you will know, path-breaking examinations of many of Shelley's overlooked and marginalised works and fragments. OK, thank you very much to each of the panellists for joining us tonight. And we're going to be discussing Shelley's fragments. Um, there have, of course, been several theories and approaches to the idea of the romantic fragment. Uh, we might see it, for instance, as um, an evolution of prior or coexisting forms, such as the supposed antiquarian fragments of Chatterton, uh, the vogue for architectural ruins, or the aesthetic ca category of the craggy picturesque. We might also look to the Yana school, uh, and approach the idea of the romantic fragment in terms outlined by the Schlegel brothers in the Athenaeum. The idea, for example, of the fragment as uh, an organically evolving whole, necessarily incomplete, or a form that reaches towards the ineffable, the inexpressible, or the ideal. In either case, we encounter in Shelley's surviving works a range of different fragments. We have, for example, works that Shelley left unfinished, such as The Triumph of Life, works composed as fragments or those titles inviting such readings, such as A Vision of the Sea. We also have notebook drafts of lines and stanzas omitted from poems that Shelley saw to print, such as those associated with Adonais. And with these sort of very general, broad observations in mind, I'd like to ask the panel as an initial question, how should we approach the idea of the fragment in relation to Shelley's work? And do we think there is a, a quintessential form that might be termed the Shellian fragment? I don't mind, um, Paul, <clears throat> I don't mind uh, trying my luck at the second part of that question because it seems to me that the way you phrased it is very good. It seems to me exactly not the case that there's a quintessential form of fragmentation. There are just too many uh, varieties of fragment, uh, both artifact, uh, as artifacts, as created examples of the romantic fragment, um, especially early on, but also later, and also so many different kinds of fragments, little poems, small things, larger enterprises, epic poems that didn't quite make it. And then, of course, The Triumph of Life, which is just uh, so interesting as a poem that is so expansive and yet it's still a fragment. So fragment always implies small, but it seems to me that if I'm right, quintessential, it's not. I don't think you can say that. That's my view. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Uh, Matalinda, yes. I always find it's important for a reason that I cannot quite comprehend, and I couldn't comprehend it when I was preparing for today, but to, to make a distinction between the fragment as something that is accidentally unfinished, like the triumph of life, or something that Shelley maybe got bored of and stopped writing, <laughs> or the fragment that is sort of finished and written and presented as a fragment, whether it's Kubla Khan or Sadek the Wanderer, a fragment, or indeed as the Jena the school of romanticism in German, um, who are producing words that they call fragments because they have a whole theory of fragmentation behind it. And it seems for some sort of aesthetic reason that there is a distinction to be made and it's, we shouldn't efface the two because the word that is a complete and it's incompletion is different from one that is simply incomplete. Thank you, Matalinda. So perhaps, perhaps are we suggesting there that, that, that there's a, a difficult, it would be difficult to bridge those sort of various forms of fragments perhaps? Uh, difficult to um, put them under one umbrella. And I think also that Shelley is a poet who evades totalizing and um, some grand theory. Though if he, he did theorize the fragments, I think it, it's most likely that as Matt Lindy implies, it would be um, as a result of reading A.W. Schlegel. Um, and he would have got, that would have been closest to his approach. 
But I'd like to take up the question of the triumph of life because there is a question about what kind of fragment it actually is. Um, and you know, earlier this year, volume seven of Johns Hopkins came out and uh, which I was responsible for that volume. And um, in the course of looking at triumph of life, I really came to the conclusion that we simply do not know um, whether Shelley wrote, um, say, 40 lines of it, and then he decided to go and, um, and to uh, fair copy that, and then went on to do another 450 or so um, rough draft, or whether, in fact, he wrote about 500 lines, and then, in rough, and then he thought, right, I've done about as much as I want to do. I'm going to leave it as a, as a fragment with a question that, as Mary Shelley has, and what is life, I said. And now I'm going to go back to the beginning and I'm going to start fair copying. And uh, either way, the fair copying, it, either, whichever way there's an inadvertent break off, break off, either of the fair copying or of the rough draft as he goes off to sail to Lerici and meet Lee Hunt. But the question is, um, at which point does he break off? And it does make a difference, does it, doesn't it, to how we, what sort of fragment we look at it. At it. I mean, it's unpolished either way. It's, and to that extent, it's unfinished. But it may have been conceptually what Shelley intended to do. And we'll never know. We really won't ever know. Fragments within fragments. That's a yeah. <laughs> conceptually uh, interesting concept. Um, I guess with the triumph of life. There's there's the, there's that sense, isn't there, that the it, in a way it, it's unlike any other of Shelley's fragments. Insofar as we, we we might sort of postulate that it remains unfinished for the very worst of reasons. I, I wonder if um, if any of the panelists could I uh, know or identify any other. Um, a poem or verse fragment in Shelley's work that perhaps does exemplify that sense in which it, in which it's, there's a deliberate um, open-endedness or incompletion that we might sort of parallel with um, what he was doing in the triumph of life. If I may maybe half answer that question, half address something that Nora just said about when Shelley starts revising, and not just Shelley, any poet, when they start revising their work, when they start reusing their work. I think it's interesting with Shelley because a lot of his imagery comes again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he needs to work through an image and then he leaves it. Like, you know, think of the Zuka pumpkin. Um, but say an image like the shape of light, a shape of light forming in some sort of cloudy light cloud. So you have that in the Revolt of Islam, you have that in the Fragments of an Unfinished Drama, you have that at the Triumph of Life, and the sense in which all those shapes of light that appear in different poems are like fragments of this greater image, which is Shelley's vision of the shape of light, as it were. So the sense in which that kind of reuse of material is fragmenting the author's of kind of internally. Um, I know fragmentation is a good way of thinking about it, but it's interesting how relations between works um, are carried on the repetition of motifs and images. And Carlene, you're on mute. Unmute. I'd probably go along with that, Madelinda, and, and uh, uh, you, you find what I found was Shelley was continually just recycling material things would be cast aside and it would be a stray line here or there. And then suddenly it would reappear and be refurbished with a new meaning and a new destiny, if you wish. Um, so yeah, the, the notion of fragment, I, I always have in my mind, some of those fragments caused him great <laughs> desperation or moments of desperation. I mean, I, I think of Charles I, I mean, he was just so angry with that. And of course, the intense rivalry with Byron, uh, who never seemed to have fragments, <laughs> um, he, he it was bothering him that this would this great masterwork he was working on would end up as merely a fragment. And I have to think that that was something very displeasing for him. I mean, I think he had a view of looking at a fragment 
um, that was conceived that way is something quite beautiful and potentially um, opening a new world. But for him personally, when something was left unfinished, I think that um, was a terrifying thought. I And Nora, to your point about triumph of life, who knows? I mean, <laughs> um, there are some who think perhaps it is indeed maybe as finished as it ever was. Um, and who's to say they're wrong? Not us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't um, if, oh, sorry. Sorry, Nora, I interrupted that. Uh, no, I was just um, thinking of, uh, about um, other, the, the, I mean, uh, that Alan, of course, has worked on Athanasia. Uh, and um, I think some very pertinent things you have to think about how Shelley created that fragment. Yes, I, 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 um, I would like to talk about that perhaps a bit later, but um, it is such a curious piece because it's a transition poem and it's a, it's a grand conception, uh, which, uh, which then takes in the end two forms, a draft and a final product, which is a considered to be a fragment by Shelley. He calls it a fragment. It's in the press copy at any rate, that's how he describes it. So again, fragment within a fragment. A draft fragment produces an artifact, which is a poem published or intended to be published, called a fragment, which is a fragment in any case of that draft. I'm sorry that sounds terribly complicated, but it is the case. And it is a poem which, um, which seems to have a lot behind its drawing on so much that's already happened. And it's a poem which is projecting forward into the Italian experience as well, to, in, to the Italy Shelley is moving into, with the platonic aspect in view. So I, I, I think it's actually very difficult to say what that work actually is. We call it a fragment rightly as a draft fragment because it didn't get anywhere, it simply collapsed or was aborted, stillborn, but it produced ultimately something which is a poem. At least we call it a poem because it's a published work. It's a work that could, could, was intended to be published and is therefore called a fragment, it's a different category. So I, I think this discussion to me is very interesting because it suggests a certain ambiguity in the very notion of fragmentation in Shelley, which has probably not been explored in any great detail. I don't know, perhaps somebody has done that, but it would be a very interesting topic for further discussion. Thank you, Alan. Uh, Alan, actually, I have, a, I have a question for you, and it picks up on something that uh, Mat Matalinda raised a, a, a moment ago concerning that idea that of sort of recurring imagery across what we might think as sort of fragmentary verse. Um, in The Unfamiliar Shelley, you discuss Shelley's Italian fragments, uh, such as the, uh, the Zucca, um, as, and I quote here, your words back at you, if I may, um, all embedded in a texture of ongoing creative thought. Um, to what extent do you think we should consider such fragmentary verse as enhancing or complicating our reading of what might perhaps be termed, um, a, a, I hesitate to use the word, but a, a complete or finalised version of a poem? You just rephrase that again, sorry, Paul. I just need to hear that again. Is oh, that sure, yeah. It's, 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 rain coming along i just need to hear it a little better oh right okay yes absolutely sorry sorry um i, I just I, I was just i was really i really taken by your phrase in the unfamiliar shelley where you talk about um uh the poet's italian fragments as all embedded in a texture of ongoing creative thought i thought that was a really lovely phrase and i just wondered if you could um sort of um, sort of help us sort of explore that a little bit um and sort of discuss what to what extent you consider such fragmentary verse as sort of enhancing or complicating our reading of what might be termed complete poems. Um, yeah, thank you. It, it's it's um, it's very it's very interesting in that um, the fragments uh, and the Italian fragments and also Athenae's earlier um, tend to draw one's attention away from, from, from the complete poems that Shelley's written, so that they suggest more, 
they take one into a different space. And that space is one of creativity itself, the flow of creativity, what's actually happening. Shelley's obviously doing several things at the same time. And um, he's experiencing Italy and he's also reflecting on it at one of the same time. So these, these poems are, are, it seems to me to be interacting with, with the environment in which he's living in. And also they don't, they don't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily, and they do not in this instance materialize into something really um, complete because they seem to me to, to have more to do with the actual um, flow of ideas, experiences that Shelley is engaging with in, in Italy seem to just want to express themselves in particular instances like um, um, Mazing, Mazing, um, like um, the Tasso fragments and also later on the, uh, the Sergio poem and so on. These are instances in which Shelley is reflecting on, on his environment and they are engaged. As for example, if we see the boat on the circuit, we may call it that. Perm seems to anticipate the triumph of life, um, both in moments of terza rima form and experimentation. So I think what, what I'm trying to express here is the fact that the poetry, the Italian fragments that we see are basically experiments. Uh, and that they are engaged uh, at, the, at a particular moment with, um, with what Chile is directly experience, experiencing in Italy. Uh, so that there is a sense in which the, 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 um, the instances in which he tries to formulate these ideas are rather, uh, rather because he's engaged with the Italian experience in so many different forms that he feels that he finds that he needs to, uh, to put that across in particular works, in particular instances where he's traveling around Italy, moving from one place to the other, and particularly in, in, in Tuscany, experiencing the, the Tuscan environment. Um, so I think that, that these, these, these poems are engaged with, uh, with, with that direct experience and at the same time exploring different aspects of it. Thank you. That's fascinating. I, I, I love that suggestion of that sort of the, the sort of biographical parallel between that sort of fragmentary um, sort of nomadic life that the Shelleys were leading in Italy during those years and, and the, the way that perhaps sort of like is articulated in the form of fragments. Um, I don't know if any of the other panellists would like to um, respond to anything Alan's just um, discussed. There's one um, case of a manufactured fragment um, where um, Shelley is, it, um, it's, it's written in Italy, and that's a vision of the sea, which is not, uh, is perhaps the least well known poem um, in the Prometheus Unbound volume of the other poems. And um, it was argued by someone in El in, in, um, in 1979, I think, that it's actually about the death of William Shelley. And, uh, um, and I looked at this and I became convinced that it was. And if so, that makes it a very, it's, it's really, it's, if it's about the death of a child, um, and I think um, it, it's, the, the um, I mean, I, I think it, it is about William. It's about Mary Shelley's mind in turmoil and she relives this event. And it's about this ship on a sea, which is being um, beset by all sorts of, uh, of disasters. And it, it ends up with a, the figure of the ship almost um, underwater, you know, almost um, totally wrecked. And all that's left that you see is a mother and a child. The child is looking at the sea and smiling at the sea. And it then breaks off with the world of the whilst. And that seems to me to be something which breaks off there because nothing more can be said. That the death of the child is a horror so inexpressible. Words fail, Shelley. 
and that seems to me to be a case of a of a of a poem that is um, meaningful in what it doesn't say and why it breaks off there. But that only works that way if you accept that that's what the poem is about. Um, and, uh, um, and that raises other questions about why Shelley breaks off as it does. I think it's a different reason what, why he breaks off for Athanasian. And, uh, and bringing back to Alan's point, I think that the fragments are so various and the motives for having fragments are equally various. Thank you, Nora. I, I, I want to immediately go and read reread the poem now with with those ideas in mind that's a beautiful reading of the poem i think and a, a, a very sad one too yeah um well i didn't i didn't originate it was an idea that came to me in somebody in somebody else and uh, you know i thought about it and that's what fragments do they they you, you read bits of what people have read and they generate other ideas and i think that for Shelley, the, the fragment that he takes from other people's writings are important. They, they create other fragments. They generate poems in his mind. Well, Alan, yes, sorry. Sorry, I don't want to delay matters, but I think it's quite oh. interesting to go back to Mazengi, mm -hmm. uh, a poem which Shelley seems to have not quite engaged with at the fullest, to the fullest extent, you know, of his creativity. Mm -hmm. It's a poem that doesn't excite one perhaps as greatly as some of the others, but it's a poem which, if you look at Euganian Hills and you look at others, there's a deep engagement on Shelley's part with the political mm -hmm. uh, background, the Italian, the Italian history, the Italian, pr the presence of Italy. And that engagement is, means that the political interests that Shelley had, that he brought with him from England, are very deeply engaged in the in the in the Italian context, as if he were, you know, testing out his ideas and finding a way in which this particular poem is also very important because of this expansive vision that he kept kept repeating in the early years. The Colosseum, Mazzengi, a few other poems keep on talking about this expanding consciousness. This Mazzengi as a person in exile who's able to engage fully with the, the natural world around him in a condition of exile. And that balance that you get in Athenaeus as well between an almost um, an exiled suffering individual cut off from his society and yet able to take that experience and engage personally in uh, be, and, and go beyond the political condition in which he finds himself, as I think it's a very central concern in Shelley's writing at this time. So whilst uh, what I want to emphasize is whilst Matsengi is perhaps not Shelley's greatest poem, as a fragment, uh, it remains a very important document and expresses central ideas that Shelley, uh, I think we all feel that with Shelley, that somehow he always manages to get a lot of his ideas across no matter what, you feel that. It seems almost like, if you think of The Witch of Atlas, an amazing poem because so much of Shelley's ideas are in that poem. Somehow or other, they get in there, they go in, get inside it. So that's, that's what I feel that if I, if I can have answered that question of yours a little bit more accurately, these poems take up issues that are in the air uh, and that I think they're very important because they help one to a very considerable extent to grasp, let's say if we go to Prometheus Unbound, how that poem really came into being, um, because it is, is, is the poem which draws on, on all these other elements in, a, in, a, in an epic form. Thank you, Alan. Um, on, on the subject of Prometheus Unbound, it, it reminds me of a, a question I, I was interested in asking, um, uh, uh, Carleen, I think, um, would, would be very well placed to answer this. That idea of um, when we read the notebooks and the manuscripts, we encounter these wonderful fragments and stanzas and lines from poems um, so that we that associated with poems, those draft texts that never made it to the final um, published form. Um, Carleen, I'm wondering, as the as the um, as the 
in, in terms of your editorial experience, you, you've transcribed and edited several poems who, whose draft stanzas and lines never made that final published version of the poem. Um, I'm thinking perhaps a text such as Hellas, which I know you've done a lot of work on. Um, how do you think that uh, we should approach such deleted or omitted fragments as readers of Shelley? And how should we appraise their contributions to the meanings of the actual published texts of these poems? What, what do you think about that relationship between the draft fragments that didn't make the published versions of the poem? Oh, okay. Um, well, um, within the context of Hellas, um, there are these unknown fragments, as you say, or fragments which have been what I find most frustrating, erroneously deciphered. Um, a lot of the issue with the fragments is that they have been insufficiently looked at and examined and deciphered. And so there's a lot of material that I think needs to be added into what, what, I, what I would call an appendix for Hellas. So the reader would come to it and would have that possibility for a full understanding of the sort of processes that went into that. Um, I have to say, for example, um, one of these examples is um, a fragment of three stanzas that are entitled, Suns and Stars Are Rolling Ever. And although it's never been identified at three stanzas, the first two stanzas have multiple drafts in uh, Shelley's Ad E7 notebook. Um, and these stanzas are finally resolved. The third stanza was developed as only a single draft version. Um, and then verse, verse and Prose, the um, Shelley Rolls ink pen book, um, published several of the early drafts of the first two stanzas as a series of short independent fragments and they were numbered one through four, but these were four or five line stanzas. Um, so what this meant was that they were varying in length, they were truncating the first two stanzas and they admitted the third stanza altogether. So this is a fragment which was pretty complete as fragments go, but it was even more fragmented by the hands of editors and publishers. Um, so such a presentation obscured Shelley's more or less resolved versions of the first two stanzas and concealed entirely the existence of a third stanza. Um, concealed also was Shelley's carefully constructed nine line stanza form with a regular rhyming pattern shared by all the three stanzas. And that pattern was A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, D with the final um, D line it was a closing um, rhyme, which became the refrain for the poem. And the line is, thou art still thyself alone. And that resumes the tetrameter of the first quatrain. So it's, it's interesting how those were there. But as I worked through these verses, all the time admiring Shelley's craftsmanship and formalizing his expression and seeking a structural coherence, which was evident in the manuscript, I had to ask, is it possible that these things were missed by scholars because these verses were considered only fragments and thus less care was taken? Um, and I think this is a question we all might consider at some point in these discussions. Um, but the story of these three stanzas goes on and becomes a test case for la critique genétique. In the two quatrains of stanzas two and three, Shelley was unable to resolve those lines satisfactorily. He left little dotted lines or a word or phrase filling in as a marker for the line but he dashed ahead in each case to fill in these um, concluding ninth line, the haunting refrain, thou art still thyself alone. Um, now, what is the purpose of these three stanzas? This, this fragment, which I, don't, I, I doubt any of you have seen or read. Well, we can speculate or conjecture. Um, embedded in among material for what has often been called the prologue to Hellas, and 
Kelvin could jump in at some point at, at some stage later, perhaps, but which we refer to it by its title line. It is the period when the sons of God, this cosmic uh, scenario containing spiritual entities, spirits and angels, as well as terrestrial beings could possibly be regarded as a stage setting for the choral interlude for that first speaker, the herald of eternity who summons the meeting in it is the period when all the sons of God. Now, like that long fragment, these three stanzas were abandoned in this form. However, the first quatrain of the first and second stanzas were adapted and developed for the great chorus in Hellas, which is lines 197 to 203. And evidence for this transformation is found much later in the notebook when Hellas was truly begun, and it's in two places. The first reworking occurs on page 186, where the first quatrain of the first stanza is brought together with the first quatrain of the second stanza. So he took parts of his three stanza fragment, reassembled them, and we come up with something like, suns and stars are rolling ever from their birth to their decay like the bubbles on a river, sparkling, bursting, borne away. Now this will sound familiar to you, I'm imagining. Um, and it goes on for the next quatrain. So this new reformulation was canceled though. And then these were worked once more later, much further into Hellas on page 232, where a shorthand selection of these langs laid out even more um, obviously, the chorus's opening, which begins, worlds and worlds are rolling ever from creation to decay, like the bubbles on a river, sparkling, bursting, borne away. Now, a question we might ask is, why did he change suns and stars are rolling ever to worlds on worlds are rolling ever? And it seems that there are several possible reasons. For one, suns and stars with that loose conjunction is simply redundant. Suns are stars and are inhabitable. Words, worlds on worlds, however, is one where humans can be found. Note as well where Shelley puts this chorus in Hellas. The preceding two lines are spoken by Mahmoud and they mark his and Hassan's exit. And they read, kings are like stars. They rise and set. They have the worship of the world, but no repose. Now, it seems likely that the use of the phrase worship of the world spoken by Mahmoud triggered Shelley to dispense with that redundant suns and stars and open the way to create this arresting and original image through that linking word world with its repetition of the sonorous OR tones. And this type of linking device is a practice I noticed used repeatedly between different speakers in another drama, Charles the I mean, Nora did a wonderful job of of identifying a lot of those sort of linking features. So you knew when one passage was to follow the other. And so in my view, you know, a, a manuscript witness like this to a fragment allows us to view Shelley's labor in composing three more or less complete stanzas. And then despite that work, putting them aside as the form for the drama Hellas took shape. And with the first exit of Mahmoud, he introduced the choral meditation on the ephemeral nature of the human condition by reaching back to that initial work begun within a different setting. And thus the, the new chorus results in an even more inventive and complex prosodic structure. Um, so that's what I'd like to say, say about, you know, how he would recycle fragments and reuse them and give them new life in a new context. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Colleen. And I, I, I would, as a reader of 
um, the, the the hard work and sensitivity of Shelley's editors, like like yourself and the rest of the panel, it's just such a, a it, it, it must be you've you've made such a wonderful contribution again to that sort of idea of reconstructing from the notebooks something sort of sort of beautiful that really enhances our our reading of the sort of the published text as well. Um, it must be wonderful from your your perspective as an editor to really engage with that or to, to really sort of yeah well really sort of engage in that process of the way that the images and the lines which are worked up into a published work um really you know sort of help contribute to the poems and sort of enrich our understanding of the poems uh, meaning and significance that's 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 wonderful that's given me certainly a lot of insight into what the editorial process must be like, which all four pan, you know, of um, of our panelists are, are, are such wonderful exemplars of. So thank you, thank you for that. That was that was um, intoxicating. Um, another um, direction I wanted to take the discussion, and we, we've we've focused quite a lot on the, uh, the the mature Shelley, the Italian fragments, and of course during this time Shelley was increasing his. Um, uh, the, the number of translations of um, other poets that he was he was reading and, and engaged with at the time, and I wonder if I might turn a question to Matalinda, if that's okay. Um, Matalinda, I know you, you've been doing a lot of work on Shelley's uh, translations, um, and I wondered if. Um, I might ask just a, a simple question based on your expertise. Um, what, what role do you do you feel that Shelley ascribes to these various translated fragments of perhaps longer works like Faust or, or the Divine Comedy? Um, and what's the significance of the the translation of these shorter, what we might call fragments, perhaps, um, to his broader achievements as an original poet? Well, thank you uh, for the question and thank you for asking it now because I think sometimes Shelley translates to render a work into English and sometimes Shelley translates to become a better poet in English. It's not because he wants to you know, produce a readable version but just because he wants to play with certain images, rhyme schemes, rhythms that he found in another language and he tries to put it into English or convey it somehow. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, what Alan just said about experiment really rang a bell for me in the sense of it's a kind of experiment in writing. So maybe not so much recording um, lived experience, but recording a reading experience, a linguistic experience in another language and capturing that. Um, related to that, I think Carlene spoke about craftsmanship. And I think that's also a really useful term. So it's honing his craft as a poet by translating. And in those senses, the translation fragments are not really so much you know, poems as they are just kind of examples of him being in his workshop and practicing his skills. Um, I'm also thinking about the work of David Constantine, who's a, a Germanist, and he's done a lot of work on Goethe as well as Hölderlin. Um, and he makes this claim that certain poets, and he himself is a poet who translates, um, and he traveled into another language through that translation. So he talks about his service abroad as an apprenticeship. So it really is a question of like going, learning new skills and returning to your own language. I think that's a really useful way of thinking about Chelsea's translations as well. So that as him becoming better at English. Uh, sorry. sorry, sorry, I interrupted there. Mm. Um, as I was thinking more specifically about fragments and translation, I thought it was also interesting um, what happens when Shelley does not necessarily translate something, but when he uses, well, sorry, he translates something that he puts into his own original writing, which in English would think of as an illusion or a citation. When it's translated, the source is not always as easy to find, particularly with something like Calderon, which is a lot of Shelley kind of takes phrases and images from Calderon, but because his plays are not at all particularly well known, they can be quite difficult to spot. So it's almost like a plagiarism is really hard to discover. <laughs> and so an example of that, which actually not from Calderon, but then I thought about the very I suppose quite well known example from the opening to the triumph of life, as we talked about it already today. Um, the line where he sets the scene for the poem, and he says, Before me fled the night, behind me rose the day, the deep was at my feet, and heaven above my head. Like if a reader of Goethe is likely to recognize that as a line from Faust, spoken by Faust, 
vor mir den Tag und hinter mir die Nacht, den Himmel über mich und unter mir die Wellen. So it's kind of, is it a citation? Is it a translation? Is it an illusion? It's clearly a translingual illusion. So it's kind of, it has an interesting status. But also what Shelley probably doesn't know that even in Goethe, it's actually a kind of fairy tale phrase. So it's not necessarily that Goethe is inventing that, but Goethe is himself citing other people, which Shelley might not realize. So it's got an interesting multi-level illusion in multiple languages going on there. And again, I'm not even sure if fragmentation is the right word that I would use to talk about this, but it's, it's pieces of language, pieces of imagery that are coming together like that. I sort of like, yeah, that's that's a really that's a fascinating idea. That idea of sort of lifting fragments from different languages, different poems, and sort of evolving them almost sort of organically. One might say it was all with one mind on the sort of Yenna school and those the, the, the Schlegel brothers' ideas about the sort of the the you know sort of if you like the sort of the, the significance of the romantic fragments. I, I confess it's not my necessary ex area of expertise but i wondered if, if, if in your um in your knowledge and your your expertise on specifically shelley's german translations whether there's any particular a connection we might make there between his his translation of, of german texts and the the ideas that were um coming about uh, in terms of the romantic fragments certainly in the in the Yana school I don't know if you've perhaps that's that's anything that has shaped your research at all well what's fascinating about Shelley's German translations are that he only translates Goethe's Faust so he's he reads Schlegel he's aware of some other German writers he reads uh, Schelling as well I'm sorry not Schelling Schiller uh, but there's a sense in which there's a remarkable lack of interest in translating <laughs> other German authors. And that's in itself really very interesting. I mean, his engagement with Faust is another thing that's quite fascinating because he translates Faust at two different occasions. One quite early on when he's studying German and he produces an almost line by line literal translation, which follows German word by word, even when it makes no sense in English. Um, that goes on in quite a neat fair copy or if it's a first draft, it's a really neat draft and it goes on like that for over a thousand lines. And we, at the Langman Shelley, we dated to roughly 1815. So before he goes to, uh, goes to Geneva and meets Byron and the reading files together. I know I think Nora has dated it to, Nora and Tim Webb dated it to that summer in Geneva, so 1816, but really quite early. So this, this is Shelley's first steps in German. So basically he, he decides to learn German, why we don't quite know, but then the first thing he does is translate Faust, even though his German is really not quite good enough for it. And then separately <laughs> in his final year alive, so in the spring of 1822, he again sits down to translate Faust. And that's the poetic translation that most of us know as Mayday Night and the Prologue in Heaven, um, which is a kind of wholly separate project. And that's interesting as well that he, in two different stages of his life and of his German skills, he decides to translate the same work. So you might say sort of a fragmentary understanding of German translating fragments. We've got this nesting of fragments going on there. That, um, thank you so much. That's, um, I, I'm trying to sort of draw some, some there's, there's some wonderful, wonderful parallels sort of um, and connections that, that I'm, I'm sort of drawing between um, what you've all been talking about. And I, I wonder whether we might turn briefly to the defense of poetry um, and perhaps we perhaps might find some evidence in the essay of, of Shelley himself trying to sort of draw or make some suggestive connections between these various types of um, uh, fragments or fragmentary verse or the significance of the concept or the notion of the fragment. Um, uh, Nora, if, if, I, if I might turn to you um, first on this one. Um, I'm thinking in particular of Shelley's um, observation in the defense of poetry, where he, where he, and I, I'm quoting now, he, he talks about the, the parts of a composition may be poetical without the composition as a whole being a poem. A single sentence may be considered as a whole, though it may be found in the midst of a series of unassimilated portions, a single word, even may, uh, may be a spark of inextinguishable thought. Do you think that Shelley is suggesting here that a fragment of a composition may 
be considered as a poem itself? And that's quite a broad question, but I, I don't know whether you've got any particular thoughts on that passage. Well, he, he seems to be, doesn't he? Because he, if he says it's a single sentence uh, from a larger composition may be um, considered as a poetical whole, then that's almost saying it is a poem. Um, but I ponder over this, and it's the phrase, a single word, that is so arresting, isn't it? Um, and I remember the late lamented Michael O'Neill drew my attention to this and said, isn't this extraordinary? And of course, that made me reflect. And um, it, I think I found not a case of a single word, um, but of three words together, which I think were for Shelley a spark of unextinguishable thought. And there's a notebook um, containing, it's Z12, containing a phrase from Herodotus set out as if it is the title of a poem. Um, it's a title of a fragment poem, and the three words are Asia, Gunaike, Prometeo. Please excuse my pronunciation of Greek, um, uh, if any of you Greek speakers here. And uh, the, the poem goes, um, one sang of thee who left the tale untold. Um, and it goes on to say our readers were unsatisfied. And we didn't do very much of it, but it, it's about uh, who is the thee and who is the one who sang. Well, um, given that it is under this phrase, uh, Asia, Gunaike, Prometeo, um, it sounds like the, you know, the, the singer is Herodotus and the... Um, the the is Asia, the wife of Prometheus, who um, uh, in the fragment it can be called the sort of hinterland of Prometheus and Baum. It can be dated from its position in the notebook as um, from July 1818, when Shelley is reading Herodotus and plunging into rock pools in the Banya de, de Luca and in uh, rats in high spirits to peacock on, in one letter. And he, uh, in a continuation of the passage that you cited, Paul, um, Shelley goes on to say that Herodotus is one of the, the, the historians whom... Sorry, that's my clock. Um, who... Um, <laughs> the great poet and historians who were poets and who, though constrained considerably by having to write poetry, uh, to write history according to a plan. Nevertheless, um, they filled all the interstices of their subjects with living images. And for these words seem to me to be one of these living images. And at the end of August, Shelley begins writing Prometheus Unbound. And that Asia was Prometheus' spouse is found only in Herodotus. And it's generally agreed that her introduction into the Prometheus stories was Shelley's original um, uh, contribution to the myth of Prometheus. And uh, Shelley's Asia is the agent of Prometheus's um, liberation. A, she is the one who causes his unbinding, and it's through her own liberation. And the reunion of Asia and Prometheus it, after their 3,000 years of separation, is the climax of the whole drama. And, and uh, the, uh, the referent of the being hey, Asia, and these three words, Asia, Gunaike, Polites, I'd like to suggest that we can see the record of a light bulb moment, um, of the fading coal, if you like, or Shelley would put it, a spark of inextinguishable thought. The Mythos of Binding is dependent on Asia's self-liberation. And Shelley had written previously, can man be free if woman is a slave? And that the, um, seems to me that Prometheus Unbound was originally, as its germ, its spark, or one of its germs and sparks in her story, the tale untold of Asia. And uh, um, only then is the the phrase is Prometheus really freed, and the phrase is for Shelley a poetic fragment that itself begets other poems. And so, yes, I think he did mean it.
and that a single word could be a poem in itself. Extraordinary as this may seem. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I, I will. Um, I, I don't know if any of my particular words would would count as poems in, in a in a Shelleyan sense, but um, I, I'm. That's a fascinating idea, isn't it? Yeah, the idea that a single what, what a what a provocative suggestion that is. Yeah, the idea of a yeah. single word. Wow. I mean, you may say nightingale was a was such a word. Uh, you know, spark of an extinguishable thought for not only Shelley but a great many other romantic poets. But um, I mean, there I think you have evidence of a poem starting out of a phrase that he'd read in a historian whom he considered to be a poet in the interstices at any rate. Well, I, I will certainly be choosing my words for the next half hour very carefully. And Nora, <laughs> if, if I might use your clock as the, um, as the chime to turn the discussion towards... Um, audience questions so I um if anybody in the audience would like to um ask a question to the panelists or to sort of pick up a thread that's being discussed so far then please use the uh, I think there's a raised hand function um on zoom or alternatively if you'd prefer to type your question into the chat bar then I can pick it up there and, and read it out to the panelists Neil's made a good point about Mary Shelley's editing in the chat, Paul. Did you see that? <laughs> Comment from Neil. Mary Shelley took that seriously when editing Shelley's poems after all. Are we are we talking there specifically about that in that choice of individual, that that, that sort of the, the importance of choosing the right word? I, I know when I uh, I look at the transcriptions in the in the in the Shelley, uh, the, the, you know, the Shelley Bodleian manuscripts, for example. I, I, I'm so grateful to the to the editors of those volumes for labouring over the handwriting and trying to pick the right word <laughs> that, that helps me understand what the fragments and and um, the, the published poems might mean. Um, I, I, Neil, Neil, sorry, is that is that precisely what you meant there in terms of the individual word mm -hmm. choice? No, I, I meant more her. Her saying that every word of Shelley was instinct with poetry and her preservation of fragments themselves, her presentation of fragments themselves um, from the manuscripts as worthy of serious poetic um, attention from the audience. Thank you. I'd, um, would any of the panellists like to pick up on that? We've got a couple of um, other questions, if not. Okay. Um, well, sorry, Nora, yes. Yeah, well, I, I, I just said that, that, you know, there's a problem about that. Did she, in fact, tidy them up too much and, and, and actually turn poems that are actually fragments into holes, which they weren't meant to be? Um, uh, but I think that that idea that the, she wrote, she, she pre presented fragments um, was partly a pragmatic thing that um, she, she needed to fill a book with Shelley's posthumous poems. And so many of them were censored and couldn't be published. She was forced not to, she'd have liked to have done that. And then, um, so that some things, I think Mike Rossington says, that it is actually a problem, the problem that dares not state its name, that so many of Shelley's canonical works are in fact fragments. Um, and uh, that no other romantic poet is it exactly the same. And I think sometimes we, we must say that um, there is a certain accidental quality about this happening with Shelley, um, which doesn't mean to say that Mary Shelley wasn't the, you know, Mary Shelley's choice of the fragments that she included in posthumous poems wasn't an, it showed her exquisite judgment. And um, I think that she she had a very sound sense of what were the poems that, that were instinct with poetry in Shelley. Thank you. 
I've got a, a, a question that sort of follows on from um, what we've, we've just been talking about. I, I'm wondering, we've, we've, we've focused this evening on Shelley's uh, verse works and his verse fragments. And I, I'm wondering to what extent we think we could extend some of these discussion points to um, considering his prose fragments. I'm, I'm perhaps just a, one example. I'm thinking of the uh, two fragments on reform that are sort of loosely associated with the philosophical view of reform, which we might itself consider to be, is, to a certain extent, an incomplete work. I, I'm wondering, can we extend some of these ideas to his prose fragments, or are we specifically thinking of the verse fragments in terms of their significance or the meaning of the idea of the fragment? And one thing that really strikes me, and actually this again resonates with what Nora was just saying about Mary Shelley's editing, but that when you're dealing with verse and you edit difficult draft manuscript material, you sort of know if you can identify the poetic structures, if you get the meter, if you get the rhyme pattern, that helps you, that then guides you in terms of reading the text. So you sort of know how many beats you need, and therefore you can do a more qualified guess at a word that's really legible. And I think with Mary Shelley's editing, I mean, she sometimes completes poems, but I think also when she transcribes for Shelley when he, he is still alive, she makes those small corrections or changes, which is maybe because he's standing next to her telling her what to do, or maybe because she feels competent or you know empowered to make those small changes, which are then, say, implicitly ratified if the poem is published. So I think about her transcribing copies for the press then being sent to a printer. So there's a way in which, in general, I think create, creation is much more collaborative than we always give credit to be. So there's something about you can think about how the author themselves is fragmented across the different people involved with the production of the text from the manuscript until the printed page. So are all making their little contributions. Even something as mind as punctuation can do a lot to change the meaning or the rhythm or the pacing of it. Thank you. Um, sorry, did anyone want to come in on, on what Matalind has just uh, been discussing? Um, if not, we have another question I can pose from the audience. This is a question from Anna. Um, I'm going to read it out. Um, Nora. Uh, Nora mentioned in a different occasion about how Shelley would write something, stop and then continue on a different page or notebook using some kind of symbol to mark that these fragments belonged together. Linking what Alan said about how Shelley's fragments were also a way to relate his experiences, have any of the panellists found an example where timing, something, uh, where timing something that happened in Shelley's life has helped to edit his works, placing fragments in a certain order? Um, do you mean, Anna, the, the, that these are um, knowing how to put them in chronological order? Or do you mean that one's been able to link up the fragments be, um, by, by timing them, um, being able to relate them? Um, because Shelley has linked them together with a symbol. Um, not quite sure. Uh, sorry, my camera is off because I'm having some troubles here with my yeah. computer. Um, I remember when we talked about um, your role as an editor, you mentioned something about going through the manuscripts and journals and Shelley having little symbols or something that connected different Oh, yes. Yeah. There's a bit in Charles I where he does that. There's a little round circle with a dot. Carlene will know this one well too. And then he, it's um, linked to another little circle with a dot. Yeah, we know that, eh? Um, yeah, something like that. It's not so much to, to be able to link it with Shelley's life, so much as that he's put the symbol nearby. And uh, um, sometimes, um, yeah, that'll do as an example. Um, it's it sometimes you can link up fragments because there will be 
something in in one notebook and then you find the uh, the end of the draft in another notebook but there Shelley you sometimes helped you because in fact um the the whole poem the completed and corrected poem exists somewhere else and so we see that that was sometimes his method you know he um, an example of that is um, the ones to a, to a reviewer um, the, that are in two different, the drafts are in two different notebooks. Thank and you. Might, hmm. Oh, Paul, we've lost you because you were muted. <laughs> oh dear, sorry, I was being so conscientious there. That I, I, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so I was just saying, we've got a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Paul Wickman first and then to uh, Kelvin Everest, if I might. So, Paul, can I ask you to kindly unmute and to pose your question? Yes. Hello there. Thanks, everyone. Some really interesting points. It's really great. Um, and uh, this you sort of op you open the discussion thinking about what, how, what we understand by fragments and how there's lots of different ways to think about what is understood by a fragment. I mean, we can be all deconstructive about it and say all poems are ultimately fragments at some stage of their composition. Um, but something I was uh, thinking about was you, you did speak a little bit about poems that call themselves fragments, which a lot of the Romantic poets did. Uh, but what about Shelley's use of the word fragment or fragments in the poetry itself, like uh, as in kind of a thematic concern of the poetry. I mean, the one that struck, uh, one that I was thinking of was Adonais stanza 52, uh, where it uh, has the reference, the one remains, the many change and pass, heaven's light forever shines, earth's shadows fly, life like a dome of many colored glass stains the white radiance of eternity until death tramples it to fragments. Um, and that's interestingly just after a passage which is often read as alluding to Shelley's sorrow over the death of William Shelley, which kind of reminded me a little bit of what you were saying, Nora, about a vision of the sea and how mm. like that sort of a fragmentary um, there. But obviously it has a different meaning there. It's just a sort of interesting um, uh, thought anyway. But so uh, what about Shelley's reference to fragments in his poetry itself, I suppose, rather than bits of poems that are fragments, but his use of like that word fragment, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I mean it. It's. I mean Shelley's much. Of, um, you know, I, I don't think Shelley's a systematizer, and I don't think you can talk about him having a, a, a philosophical system towards the fragment. Um, though Mary Shelley um, did did say that he was evolving a, a, a kind of a theory of. Uh, as, a philosophical system, whether it would have included fragments, I don't know. But um, metaphors of, frag of fragmentation are so prevalent in his writing it's, that it, it's got to be something very significant. And Bishkoff's recent publication, Shelley's Broken Word, takes account of this and addresses it from a certain point of view. Um, he really, I think he means that he, we don't see things as they really are. We can't know. Um, if we do see, uh, if we, you know, if we apprehend reality, it is as fragments. And um, he he writes uh, that this reference of seeing things in fragments, um, it, you clearly can find things in his in his poetry in his fragments. For instance, there's one that goes, um, um, uh, uh, oh, oh, what is it? What is that thing about? But it has the lines. Um, what is it that makes us seem to patch up fragments of a dream? This is one of the, um, it's in the one of the notebooks that Carling identified. And um, is, it, is it in this life that we see more than in, um, yeah, anyway, it's about, it's about how we don't actually see life as it is. We can only speculate. We get gleams of what are called reality. And, um, yeah, I think he, he's always talking of fragments and life as a as a brittle glass that comes over again in triumph of life. Life is broken. We remember things in fragments. Um, and, you know, memory comes in fragments. We only remember our infancy in fragments. Yeah, it's 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 very prevalent. You you're right. 
in, the, in I think that's the meaning in Adonais as well, isn't it? It's 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 death that that brings us back to the one, isn't it? Away from the fragments, life is fragmented. Where it's kind of it's in in death, it's kind of unified with the all light, isn't it? I suppose. Yes, that's my interpretation. But yeah, light yeah. is broken. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, unless any of the other panellists would like to follow up on Nora's response to Paul's question, um, I think we can turn to uh, Kelvin, I think, had a question too. Kelvin, you're muted. I'm an idiot. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> Loud and clear. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only idiot among Shelley's editors. Um, <laughs> um, I was just saying that how much I enjoyed um, the Christmassy background to Paul's um, to Paul's uh, contribution there. I saw Father Christmas hat on top of the tree there. Um, um, so Nora, I'd like to come back to you with uh, following up on Anna Anna's question about linking Shelley's life to bits of fragments. Um, so I've been thinking in general as we've been going on that um, um, when you talk about F Shelley's fragments, it takes you back to the material existence of them, doesn't it? You think of them on the on the on the notebook page, and they're 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 more locked into the ink and the pencil and the paper somehow than than the stuff that's escaped into proper print editions and things. And so you you do feel a bit closer to the the kind of texture of, of his existence. And, and so bearing that in mind and thinking about triumph of life, that there, there's, a, there's a fragment in a manuscript which has got some intriguing clues or not clues about what was going on at the time. So I'm thinking about Jane. And um, so there's a, there's a challenging a cheekily challenging um, bit of your magnificent new edition, Nora, where you you argue that, alas, I kiss you, Jane, in that tiny writing between two lines there, right at the end of Triumph of Life is a completion of the poem. Uh, well, you're calling it um, Time is Flying. I'm not convinced that that is actually the first line of the, that he wanted, but... Um, what, what, what do you, what's your take on the, the evidence that's sprinkled through the Triumph manuscript about the, the state of the relationship between Shelley and Jane Williams? Well, um, as you know, um, Kevin, it was um, the founder of, of the Longman edition, Geoffrey Matthews, whom I unfortunately never met, but whom I had some brief correspondence with at the end of his life, which I treasure. And it was he who raised this question of the relationship between Shelley and, and Jane and brought it to life. Um, I, mean, the, I, I mean, the, the thing that I, I, I needs to be, to be also added to that is the poem, we meet not as then we parted, or rather that you put um, the, you know, that's moment is gone forever, um, it, which it also exists in the ads, the, the Huntingdon 2111 volume, which is along with Far, Far Away, you he has in the memory, and it's part of, a, a, of three poems. And it's the most chaotic and the most, it, I mean, you can read it just tormented looking. Um, and you can, uh, uh, you know, as if Shelley is writing in such agitation of, uh, and, of, and about having um, asked Jane for a kiss and not got it, perhaps. Um, and and the, the writing seems to, to have this quality about it. Um, it's very easy, isn't it, to construct um, stories around handwriting where it seems hasty and agitated and and and, and, and describe emotion to it um, i I accept that the the fact that the poems at the end go and 
seem to suggest that 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 Shelley is in a state that is extremely um, that, that he is he is in, involved with this situation with with Jane and it is tormenting him. Um, some people would say that you should not publish the triumph of life without these poems. They ought, ought to be interspliced, you know, exactly as they are in the in the leaves. But then you have a problem about the ordering of the leaves. I mean, there have been a hundred and forty years since those leaves were well, two hundred years since those leaves were written, and in in what way were they found? So I I do go round and round on these questions about it, but that there is a relation between the poems in the Triumph of Life manuscript, as I call it, um, and, the, and the poem, poem, The Triumph of Life, seems very evident to me. Um, I've, I've suggested my Tupni work, but the other critics will, will again find much to say about it. Can I, can I just say one more thing about the manuscript of TL and going back to uh, an earlier bit of, of, of the discussion, much earlier bit of the discussion this, this evening, actually. Um, I mean, the, what we make of the fair copy of the first few lines of Triumph of Life is quite momentous, isn't it, really? Because, yes. Um, I mean, it, there's a, the possibility that he started to copy it out neat because he reckoned it was more or less finished. It's, yeah, that is, quite, that is quite significant. Isn't it, it? it it makes it means that Mary Shelley was not um, necessarily wrong in ending it where she did, no. but she might have been wrong. We, you know, but she might have been totally me, wrong. Yeah. What worries me about it, Nora, is that is the paper because it's on the it's on the the Benedetto Parodi paper, isn't it? With big yeah. part of this Italian paper, and it's obvious that towards the end he's running out of it because he's using all sorts of funny bits of paper to keep it going. And yet that fair copy is on, is on, is on Benedetto Parodi paper as if, as if it, at that point he wasn't worried about running out of it. He would, would, he have started, would he have started copying out the whole thing if, it, if he was running out of the paper? See what I mean? Well, well you don't, uh, I, I mean, Donald Ryman thought it was obvious that he was running out of paper, but um, can one be sure of that? There are letters written on Benedetta Parodi paper on, um, at a very late stage as well. And um, while there's not an awful lot of Benedetta Parodi paper that lies outside the Triumph of Life manuscript, there is some. And Mary Shelley said he went writing in, in the little shallop, you know, nipping in and out of coves and things like that. How do we know that he didn't snatch up a few odd papers um, or that at the moment in, in an impulsive way and didn't, you know, when he was getting, getting near the end, he might have got more excited and agitated and started to, you know, just pick up papers that were near to him. Again, we, we just don't know. I'm in a quandary, just like, a, just like you. <laughs> Thank you, Kelvin. Um, another great question. Thank you. Yeah. We've got an, we've got another question um, from Oliver Ramirez, and I think this one can I'll, I'll go to each panelist in turn, if I may, on this one. And the question is a straightforward one. Um, which fragments did you all find the most interesting to translate or transcribe um, in each of your sort of um, in your expertise as editors of Shelley's work. Yeah, which, is there any particular fragment that you found interesting to transcribe or to translate that was most illuminating for you, that, that really helped you, that really helped transform your appreciation or, or understanding of a particular poem? Um, Well, I can have a go and at, I think my answer is quite clear and simple. I mentioned that Shelley in 1815 or 16 translated a thousand lines from Goethe's Faust into, in a very literal way, which means that half the time it reads as if he has forgotten the English language and sat down to kind of do this bonkers thing. So I really enjoyed working on it because it was just so fun. <laughs> Bad poetry, but very much fun.
Paul. Uh, yes, Alan. Yes, go ahead, please. Um, I didn't have the good fortune of translating, uh, transcribing any of the fragments that I that I've dealt with. At least I can't think of of having done so. I can't remember, but I. I think Alan's frozen. Oh, um, I think, yes, is he frozen? Uh, Colleen, we, we, perhaps, it, sorry, I'll, I'll, perhaps you'll step in and we'll perhaps Alan. go back to Alan when his yeah, uh, connection. Yeah. Um, the, the one I enjoyed was, uh, again, another selection from Hellas. It was, um, well, it's become much more long than it normally is published. It's the uh, lines, I would not be a king, enough of woe it is to love. The path to power is steep and rough and tempests reign above. It's one that's been very popular and has done, um, and it complete, uh, let's see, it finishes with the last two lines. Would he and I were far away keeping flocks on Himalay. And so this um, little uh, 12 line or 11 line fragment has been picked up and published in um, even as a song. And it, so it's gained a sort of, um, traditional uh, history within its, it has its own publication history. But what I've discovered is in fact, it's the only first stanza to a, an entire her harem scene for Hellas, which he wanted to use with Fatima and then the surrounding maidens. And so there's a dialogue that goes between the maidens and Fatima and it's on the nature of love and she is, has this, this total uh, consuming love for Mahmoud, but the Greek slave women, of course, see this as a devastating type of relationship to be in, which reminds me of Nora's earlier statement about um, is it Asia, the woman must be free before man is free uh, entirely. And so that was a very beautiful scene to put together, but it doesn't exist anywhere yet <laughs> but as a fragment and it's and the the question you have to ask is again why did Shelley leave that mm -hmm. out of Hellas um and again I think it's because he didn't want it to interfere with um the the overall strategy of Hellas which was to um delineate and you know muster up support for the Greek struggle for independence so to cloud it with this domestic scene, I think would have been wrong. So that was what was interesting for me. That was a new thing. Yeah. Thanks. A case where Shelley had a plan um, yeah. that interfered with putting in, with the poetry, in fact, yeah. that, that existed. And then he, he removed the, the names yeah. of Fatima, for example, and she only becomes Indian slave in the text. Yeah, um, as we we know it, but um, no, it's a it's an interesting dialogue that he sets up. But that is he totally got rid of that and left it out. Mm. Yeah, well, for me, the fragments, um, every single fragment I went to, I discovered something new about it. I mean, it, it's obviously say the frag the triumph of life because that was um, was a big, very big privilege. To, to do that, but I would say that I, there wasn't any fragment that I've edited that I didn't see something new about at all that illuminated the rest of Shelley. Now I'm truly going to say all is contained in each when it comes to Shelley. Thank you, and and, and Alan, we we you, you we have you back as well, unfortunately. Yes. Oh, sorry, I my my. Transmission was lost for a second. I, I was saying or trying to say something very similar to Nora, although Nora's got much more experience than I have with the texts and uh, and perhaps transcribed them herself, herself. But because I was having to go back to the manuscripts and I could not look at any of these fragments that I dealt with were all in a, in a, in a not a good state editorially. I would be have been much more fortunate right now because I think the texts are now beginning to be actually published, uh, you know, in a form that we can be happy with. But at the time, I had to go back to the manuscripts always so that I was engaged 
almost as if I were transcribing them, looking at all the details and being very conscious of how incredibly difficult they are to, to read. And that, you know, we owe so much to, to the editors to have done an enormous work to try and make them intelligible. But they're actually not really intelligible. Uh, I think that time, at times Shelley would have even have struggled to make out exactly what he'd just been writing because it's so so uh, crossed out and, and, and there's so much going on. So I think that to me, the, the fragments are, are absolutely fascinating, always, whatever they are, simply because they engage you so much more powerfully than one would if one were just reading the final drafted edition of that text. And I, I think that, that that is where the body and manuscripts come in and are so very, very helpful because they, they take you back to the living moment of, of writing and, uh, and, and, and that, you know, to, to a very considerable extent, when we talk about fragments, we're not thinking really only about a cleaned text, but actually of a very messy draft, yeah. which uh, is, is, is very complicated. Um, but, um, you know, Alan, and uh, yeah. this is to pick up some a question that Paul put about the the, the, pro, the prose and the poetry. Is yes. it not remarkable that apart from little memoranda and jottings, that most of Shelley's prose is it, it's so much neater than the poetry, and yet it, it, the, the prose is draft and the and um, do, do you think that Shelley actually wrote prose much more easily, and that or more slowly as he thought it out. Whereas when he's writing um, draft uh, poetry, it really is bubbling out of his head. Um, and that that's why the, the prose is comparatively readable as, we, as it has come down to us. Uh, I think that is a very fascinating point. Um, yes, I think that must be to some extent the case that because it's prose, it's having to uh, it's having um, to to be written in a different mode of thought, where sentences and sentence construction, syntax pre predominate. And because Shelley, I think, is an absolute master of prose. I mean, yeah. we're talking always about him as a poet, but I've always been absolutely fascinated by the the sheer quality of the prose. So that, in fact he was so uh, uh, comfortable with writing in prose that I, perhaps it explains to, to, to a certain extent that he was, um, it's probably easier, as you were suggesting, to, to, to write a draft in prose than it is in verse. I think we can already agree to that. But in Shelley's case, as you say, it is very marked. And I'm not quite sure how to explain it, except to say that it is, a, it is, it is very noticeable. And wherever you, wherever you go in, in those prose texts, even when they are themselves fragments, like the uh, future state, it is a fragment, but there are just a few odd corrections here and there, an occasional deletion and so on. But um, I think we, we need to recognize that Shelley's gr uh, handling of prose is so, so expert. And that, uh, while of course that doesn't reflect on the on the writing of verse, it just means that he's able to put this down much more um, much more easily than he would in verse, which is so much more complicated by 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 verse patterns and and by getting the line into the right shape and and getting the ideas into a condensed form, um, which prose probably doesn't demand. Thank you, Alan. Um, I've just looked at the clock. I was so swept away with what you were talking about. I realised that it's now 8.35 and the the event um, ended five minutes ago. Um, so I will therefore take this uh, formal opportunity to thank the audience for attending the event uh, and particularly to thank the panellists for their time and expertise and sharing their wisdom with us here tonight. I, was, I, I thought it was absolutely fascinating. And we we skimmed the surface, I dare say, of what we could possibly discuss. I, I think if, if 
I wouldn't ask you to stay here for another few hours to share your expertise, but um, I would love to do so in theory. So I just want to thank our four panellists this evening, to Carleen, to Alan, to Matalinda and to Nora. Thank you very much.